Good evening and welcome to a new edition of Rausgeblickt, the web talk of Friedrich Ebert Stiftung. Rausgeblickt is, I'm afraid, a very German phrase. You could probably translate it with, with looking out, looking forward, thinking out of the box. That's probably a more or less accurate uh, translation. But the idea of this web talk is very simple. The idea is that COVID-19 might probably not change every aspect of our life, but it will definitely leave deep sincere traces in our societies and it depends on us if we come out of this pandemic with a with a better with a fairer with a more sustainable society or if things go worse and in this web talk we try to be optimistic we want to look at the chances of the current situation we did talk with a variety of high ranking and highly interesting people but today it's it's a really outstanding event because our guest tonight is professor dr joseph stieglitz it's great to have you with us uh, nice to be great. here and, and joe is outstanding in in so many ways he's an outstanding and and brilliant uh, academic as you know he has enriched the economic debate and economic research since the 60s with publications on, on the markets, on information and information asymmetries, on globalization, of course, on inequalities and a variety of issues. Uh, and he was rewarded with the Nobel Prize in economics for that. So that's as high as it can get. And he's outstanding also as a public intellectual, uh, enriching the public debate and influencing the public debate with a variety of, of public uh, publications and other con contributions. And um, you are um, advisor to politics. So you actually go into politics. You did advise around 50 governments around the globe, um, uh, like the Obama administration, the Clinton administration, and you were vice president and chief economist of the World Bank. So it's it's a great honor and a great pleasure to have you here. Yeah. Incredible background. My name is Christian Krell. I'm professor for uh, constitutional law and politics at the Federal University of Germany. And Joe and I, we agreed on a more or less small agenda for our debate. We will start by looking at the current situation by the COVID-19 situation and its effects on globalization. And then we will look a bit deeper at general trends uh, concerning globalization, concerning inequalities, and also uh, touch the link to democracy in our societies. And we will close by the question, what to do? If we don't want to leave the world as it is, if we want to make it a better place, what do we have to do? What are the instruments? What are the ideas? Um, and you are most welcome to join our debate. There's a chat down there. Um, you have to register with a name and then you can contribute and follow the chat. Um, and there's a team in the background that will provide us with, with your questions. And whenever possible, I will pose those questions. Um, so Joe, you've, you've written on globalization um, intensely and there are two books uh, in the German translation one is called Shadows of Globalization in the German translation, uh, Globalization and its Discontents. The other one is Chances of Globalization, how to make globalization work. What would be your title of the book on globalization in times of COVID-19? I guess I would say more broadly, uh, I'd have something like uh, Build Back Better, to use the name <laughs> that Vice President uh, uh, Biden has been saying, uh, you know, lessons of the of the uh, pandemic and its economic aftermath. Uh, but uh, COVID nineteen has raised a large number of issues uh, dealing with globalization, going in two different directions. Um, one of them is uh, it has made us realize that. We live in a small planet. Uh, the nasty virus doesn't carry a passport or doesn't recognize visas. Uh, we're all in this together. It emphasizes the need for more global cooperation. And we have some uh, multilateral institutions. They're not perfect, but they actually work reasonably well, as well as governments do. Uh, the World Health Organization, 
uh, the IMF has taken up uh, uh, enormous leadership in responding to the economic aftermath in developing countries and emerging markets. So the first thing is uh, it reminds us of the importance of global cooperation. But on the other hand, it has also exposed uh, a weakness. Uh, we saw that our economies were not very resilient. Here in the United States, we saw that we couldn't make simple products like masks, uh, protective gear. Uh, we had created, we become dependent on a very, uh, on a global supply chain that was not resilient. Uh, we couldn't make complicated products like tests or ventilators. So we realized that by getting so dependent, we had undermined the resilience of our economy. But of course, I look at this a little bit in a broader context. We saw in the crisis of 2008 that the private sector was very short-sighted. It didn't know how to manage risk. It undertook too much risk in the short, greedy quest for profits in the short run. And this is very much what's happened with globalization in the global supply chains. They looked for saving a penny here, a penny there, without any view about what happens if, if there is something like a pandemic or uh, an interruption in the global supply chain. You know, it, it's more broad. I talked about uh, we built cars without spare tires. And as long as you don't have a flat tire, you save money. But once you have a flat tire, you're in a very bad situation, especially if it happens when you're far away from a, a, ga a, a gas station. So those are the two aspects. On the one hand, it's exposed weaknesses in our globalization as we've managed it. And on the other hand, it's uh, reinforced the need for global cooperation. All of this comes at a, you might say, inconvenient time because for the last four years, we've had a president in the United States that has been undermining the international rule of law, attacking multilateralism, um, attacking the principles of cooperation. And so, uh, Unfortunately, in the context of all the negative aspects uh, that he's been emphasizing, uh, the awareness of the lack of resilience of these global supply chains uh, is a particular concern. So it, it, it comes at, at a a difficult time, as you said, um, um, we saw a variety of kinds of reactions of individuals and also of states. And you mentioned already uh, parts of the reaction of the US. Um, um, we, we saw on the individual level that people reacted with a tremendous amount of solidarity. They organized, uh, cooperated to, to help the elderly, the most vulnerable, etc. But we also saw the total opposite egoism, a very individualistic approach. Uh, could you transfer that also to the state level? Did you also see that variety of approaches and, and where is the US? In that, uh, very much spectrum? so. So for instance, um, one of the things that's going on internationally is a quest for vaccines, therapeutics, and the scientific community has never acted in a more cooperative way. Mm -hmm. They decide their short-term, yeah, as an academic, you understand uh, the importance of publications and, and they put all that aside as they work uh, 24 hours a day to find answers to the vaccines and therapeutics. And the scientific community is committed to making sure that that knowledge is used for the betterment of everybody. And they want this to go most to where it's with a prioritization 
where it's most important, protecting health workers, for instance, because if we don't protect them, we are all exposed. So they've really shown the kind of leadership that we need. But at the government level, you have two different kinds of reactions. You have Costa Rica leading the charge at the WHO to have total sharing of the intellectual knowledge that is the basis of responding to COVID-19, making sure the vaccines are available to everybody. Uh, they've also uh, been spearheading a, a campaign to make sure that there is enough money for the developing countries and the emerging markets. So that's, that's you might say, on the positive side. And, you know, a small country can have a real leadership uh, in this. On the other hand, you have the United States with its vaccine nativism, uh, with Trump saying uh, he didn't even want the United States to allow the export of uh, material re related to masks, mm -hmm. not realizing that we import more than we export of key critical healthcare uh, products. And if every country imitated what he was doing, we would be in a terrible fix. So it's sort of the kind of uh, short-sighted, uh, I would say almost ignoramus, <laughs> uh, 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 not even understanding what's in your own self-interest, uh, but a kind of nativist uh, bringing out the worst and this contrast between some countries acting in a way that brings out the worst and other countries really asking, uh, acting in ways that brings out the best in humanity. So even if we put aside, let's say moral um, issues like, like solidarity and all the questions, it's, it's kind of irrational, that behavior that you described. It's not in your own self-interest not to cooperate. Yeah. That's right. And in two dimensions, and I always t t emphasize there's a link between health and the health of the economy. Um, the disease is going across borders, as I said in the beginning. And if we don't control the disease everywhere, it will be a threat everywhere. So it is in the interest of everybody in the world that this pandemic be brought under control. And that's why we had uh, campaigns about the eradication of smallpox, the eradication uh, of measles and all, you know, polio. Um, we recognize that we have to get rid of the disease everywhere. So uh, that's in everybody's self-interest. The same thing is true in the area of the health of our economy. We won't have a strong global economic recovery until we have it everywhere. In 2008, China played a critical role in the global recovery. Uh, they grew at eight, nine, 10, 11, up to 13%. And that was a real boom uh, for the whole world. That's not gonna be happening now forecast of China are that it's maybe grow one, two, three, four percent maybe, but uh, it's already curtailing some of its um, imports. It's trying to uh, it go back to having more uh, surpluses. So it won't be the engine of global economic growth. So we need a broad-based economic recovery. And so it's in the interest of the every country to make sure that every country recovers strongly. And right now, to give you a, just one example of this, is the IMF has called upon the international community to have an uh, issuance $500, $500 billion of special drawing rights. These are special kinds of, of you might say, internationally created money that allocated in ways that would be enormously valuable for the developing countries, emerging markets. You know, the developed countries have had enormous 
package rescue packages, the emerging markets and developed countries can't afford it on their own. And this would be a real a aspect of solidarity, but as you put it, solidarity that's in the advanced country's interest. The United States is the vetoing this, the Trump administration. Let me make it clear. It's not the United States. Uh, it's Trump uh, and the Trump administration that is vetoing this. Uh, the Democrats in both the House and the Senate have actually put in bills that would increase the SDR to $2 trillion. And that would really help. Uh, the emerging markets in developing countries. So they realize, we realize that we're in this boat together. But unfortunately, we have in Washington an administration that uh, doesn't understand lots of things and is extraordinarily selfish and short-sighted. I'm glad that you mentioned that so clearly. I always tell to my students, it's it's not the US in general, it's a specific administration. So I will refer to you to prove that. Um, let us dig a bit it, it deeper at questions of globalization. You did focus for decades on globalization. And when you look at globalization, um, we had a trend for the last three to four decades where globalization was driven by a certain idea, by a certain paradigm, if you might say so. And, and you call that paradigm, as far as I understood, free market fundamentalism. So what is that and why is it fundamentalism? Well, I call it free market fundamentalism uh, by analogy to uh, ide the ideology and religious fundamentalism. Uh, it's a religion. It's a belief that markets always work. Unfettered markets work best. And this is a subject of scientific inquiry. Uh, I feel strongly about it because it's what I made much of my life work, where you, you look at this uh, theoretically, empirically, and, uh, you know, there, there are important ideas, influential ideas, uh, sometimes ideas that are put forward at one time are shown to be wrong at a later time. And we've learned a lot in some 200 years. So, for instance, there was the idea that put forward by Adam Smith in 1776, that's, you know, almost 250 years ago, that uh, the pursuit of self-interest leads, as if by an invisible hand, to the well-being of everybody in society. Now, let me make clear, Adam Smith didn't believe it. He thought it was an interesting idea, but he went on and pointed out that companies always, get, people, all, businessmen always get together and engage in conspiracies to raise prices in anti-competitive behavior. To, they try to suppress workers, you know. So he understood that you needed regulation, you needed to have government to push education, to push competition. So he didn't believe in the invisible hand. But there are some descendants uh, who didn't understand Adam Smith. But one of the important results that my work with my colleague at Columbia, Bruce Greenwald, was to show that the reason the invisible hand was invisible was it wasn't there. That uh, the pursuit of self-interest does not lead to the well-being of society. Corporate greed, greed by the banks, led to the financial crisis. It didn't lead to prosperity of all our countries. Uh, and now, even in the hotbed of market fundamentalism, the United States, corporate CEOs have now finally recognized that the pursuit of shareholder value does not lead to societal well-being. In many ways, in Germany, you might be very interested that uh, there's a broad consensus across corporate leaders that 
stakeholder capitalism, which has been part of, of the German model with uh, concern about workers, customers, community, the environment, are all important as well as shareholders. So this has been a, a, a sea change, change, at least in rhetoric and in perception. So, so it's a quite significant change. Yeah, the belief, the, the, the religion, as you described, it has probably, at least on an intellectual level, come to an end. Um, even though when we look at the, the global institutions, also the regional institutions, like the, the European community and, and other institutions, we see that this ideology, the very belief in the market is enshrined, so to say, in the institutions. It's institutionalized itself. Um, so so how, how do we change that? Well, I mean, the point you raise is, is a really important one. Societal change often lags behind intellectual change. And we have that problem in the United States. A lot of the Supreme Court decisions mm -hmm. about the nature of competition were made during the era of this market fundamentalism where people said, oh, markets are always competitive. You know, you have to say, uh, you live in a different planet. Uh, look around, see market power. Uh, see the domination in sector after sector of one, two, three firms. That's not a competitive market. But the ideology prevailed and we have to deal with it now. So your question is, is a really uh, appropriate question. I think it's just going to be a constant battle. Uh, uh, for instance, let me give you just a, 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 an example right now that Europe is going through. Um, in the era of neoliberalism, uh, the view was the, the state shouldn't intervene at all in the market. But Europe has now committed itself to a green recovery. Why? Because it is obvious that the world, the economy based on fossil fuel was heading us for disaster. It was obvious that on the own, on its own, the market wouldn't, couldn't avoid that disaster, that the governments needed to steer the economy to a greener economy. And the government had both the resources and the tools to do it. So officially, Europe has not abandoned the ideology of neoliberalism. In practice, it has. And as people in the young generation sees this, things are going to change. You know, uh, there's an old saying, uh, science progresses slowly, funeral by funeral. <laughs> and um, there is a sense in which my optimism about societal change is based not on the funerals, but on the young people. It's cohort of students by cohort of students. And I see all the young people are aware of climate change. Many of them are aware of the extent to which markets engage in exploitation, worried about market power. So all these things are, you know, a sea change from what it was, you know, when the European Union was founded and especially when the Eurozone was founded in the Maastricht uh, Treaty of 1992. That's true. It's, it has been a long way from, from that, uh, from the treaties that were written in that um, decades and in that era. Um, so, so there's reason for optimism. That's good. Um, yeah, and you have to remember that particular period was a period of market optimism. Mm. The, iron, the communism had just been defeated. We viewed it as the triumph of the market economy. And so, you know, everything has to be viewed in light of a particular historical circumstances. And uh, that gave uh, an enormous amount of confidence to markets. But of course, it wasn't that markets succeeded 
as much as it was that communism failed. And we, we should have been aware of the inherent problems with communism, but we should also have been aware that the market was not succeeding, for instance, in uplifting the lives of large fractions of our population. It was exactly at this point that inequality was really growing in countries around the world. And so it was in the period where glo uh, globalization and financialization was doing so much to help the 1%, leaving behind so much of the bottom 99%, and leading in the United States to the kinds of political problems that we have today. Um, that are based on uh, the discrediting of the elites who advocated these particular policies and said, oh, it would all trickle down to everybody. Didn't happen, and predictably so. We, we definitely have to come back to that question of, of inequality to, to the consequences, so to say. Um, let me pose one question one of, of the, the audience uh, uh, followers has, has posed to us. You're saying that the globalization has advanced under the mantra of free market uh, fundamentalism. But, but what now? Now this mantra is challenged, so to say. We have a new belief that we need the state in certain aspects. Will that lead to a process of deglobalization? Will it lead to a different globalization? What, what do you think? I think it's going to lead to a different globalization. And to some extent, it will be a deglobalization. Uh, I think there still will be global supply chains. But they'll be more diversified. Uh, there'll be... Uh, some onshoring, but not necessarily a lot. The evidence is that there's not a lot of that. But when that onshoring occurs, it'll be disproportionately robust. It's not going to solve the problem that we didn't, that we messed up on 30 years ago. Uh, we have to go on and go on to the next stage of our of our growth, our development, and and make sure that we have inclusive growth that brings in everybody. Um, but we can't go back, you know, Trump in the United States, uh, you know, Trump wants to bring back coal, wants to bring back uh, uh, industries that are clearly not going to be brought back. That won't happen. Uh, what we have to do is say, okay, we make some mistakes. What do we do now to rebuild? And that's where rebuild back better is, is, is really, uh, an important, uh, Uh, part of uh, the agenda uh, at, at, at this point. Um, I think there is one aspect that we haven't talked about mm -hmm. that is going to be very important for Europe uh, to grapple with. And that is um, even if Well, two, two basic principles. First is, we have to make sure that globalization benefits everybody. And uh, it won't happen automatically. You know, back when uh, uh, some of the trade agreements were signed in the 90s, many of us in the Democratic Party said we were worried about the effects of displaced work on displaced workers. And we said, we have to have assistance to what you are, Europe, you call active labor market policies to move people from the jobs they're losing to new jobs and the active industrial policies to create new sectors as old sectors get phased out. We fought, but we lost the Republicans like the idea that there is more hardship among workers. You might say, why? Because that weakened the bargaining positions of workers in America. And for them, this was a double. They get cheap labor abroad and they get cheap labor at home. So they 
They like this globalization that work for corporate interests and against workers in both developed and developing countries. We can't have that. The new globalization has to make sure from the start that everybody is better off and it can't be based on trickle down economics. That's the first. The second thing is in the aftermath of the end of the Cold War, there was a kind of euphoria that we would be all moving to market-based economies based on rule of law and democracies, liberal democracies. Francis Fukuyama put it so strongly, he said the end of history uh, because we were all converging to the same model. It, it looks like uh, uh, a Pollyannish fantasy today. Uh, we're not converging. But that's still, it is still the case that we have to cooperate with countries with different political and economic systems. So we need to cooperate with China to solve the problem of pandemics, global health, global knowledge, and climate change. So we have to cooperate. So that makes sense. Explain it by an analogy. If you're on the Titanic and the ship is going down, you put in a lifeboat. There's some people in the lifeboat that you really, really don't like. But are you going to sink the lifeboat? Or are you going to try to save the lifeboat? And then as you're going, you, cannot, you don't say, I love you, just because you're in the same lifeboat but you find ways of cooperating with people you don't like. And all of us in our daily life know that we've learned to how to do that and countries will have to do that. But at the same time, we can't compromise with our values. We know that trade isn't necessarily going to accelerate the move towards market economies, free market economies, or liberal democracies. It hasn't happened. So we have to be explicit and strong in our commitments to democracy and human rights. And if countries anywhere violate those, whether they're our friends or not so friends, we have to be clear. So I think it's perfectly appropriate for Europe to criticize the history of America where we engaged in racial discrimination. And the support in Europe for the Black Lives Matter, I think helps in America. But we can't take our eye away from what's happened in Hong Kong or the Uyghurs. And figuring out how to, to manage this is going to be a big challenge, particularly for Germany, because you become very economic dependent on uh, China. And, uh, but you can't let that economic dependence cloud your commitment to human rights and democracy. So we have to cooperate, but we also have to make clear what our values, what our principles are and, and come, come back to them. As I understood, the, the notion that we have that this kind of free market globalization and the spread of democracy is linked, that's a false assumption. It hasn't happened. It hasn't happened. It was not an unreasonable hypothesis, let me say. And I, you know, I, I was optimistic, you know, I... Over this period, I had a lot of engagement with many countries, and um, uh, there were many, many places where it has taken root, but there are some places where it hasn't. From a global perspective, we are, when it comes at the spread of democracy, we are kind of a down, we witness a downward trend. The return of Unfortunately, since Trump, the last five years, four years have been really hard. Uh, and the absence of US leadership, or let me say, 
the love affair that Trump has with authoritarian figures is has been devastating for democracy. And that's why you've seen the growth of demagogues and authoritarian figures and in Brazil, India, of course, in Russia, never did get to be a full democracy. And the reality is that uh, uh, a majority of people around the world now do not live in democracies. No, and also in the democracies we had, or we still have, we see a return of authoritarian thinking connected to nativism, as you described it. You put a link between the effects of that free market globalization we had and the return of authoritarian thinking, the, uh, the, the, the distrust, growing distrust in, in democratic institutions in the US. Uh, you wrote a dramatic paper, as I would call it, Can American Democracy Come Back? Yeah. Is, the, is the worrying title. So, so what is the link between that, between the effects of globalization and the mistrust in democracy? <laughs> Well, there, there actually have been some interesting econometric studies looking at this uh, by a group at MIT. Um, what they, their studies suggest very clearly, for instance, in those parts of the United States which were most impacted by the surge of imports from China, uh, after the beginning of the new century. Um, those places have not done well economically. Uh, trickle down economics didn't work. Unemployment is higher, wages are lower, property values are lower, communities have not done well. But they also show that it has political consequences. In many places, it moved Uh, the politics far to the right. In some places, it had an effect of moving it slightly to the left, but it clearly led to polarizations and it, it, the, the move to the right was much more pronounced than the other side. So it, it seems to have reinforced this kind of uh, 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 authoritarian. And I think I... You know, it's hard to explain exactly why, but I think we have a, enough detail, uh, mostly contributed by work of sociologists looking at what happened in the community and how they perceive things. Um, the, um, it's, it, it, it's partly, as I mentioned before, that the promises of the elites weren't fulfilled. Um, but it was also, the sense of, of the distrust that the elites really cared. Uh, it was really a concern, were they really just pursuing their own interest? The, the, and it gave rise to a lot of distrust. And I have to say at this point, um, what the Obama administration did is widely viewed to have contributed to this malaise because it was seen as saving the bankers who had caused the 2008 crisis, but not doing enough to save the jobs, to save the people who were losing their homes. So the perpetrators of the problem were the ones that, that were saved. And that, of course, gave rise to the view that the system was rigged. It gave rise to the Tea Party movement. And of course, that answer was the wrong answer. It wasn't that you should allow the banks to go rampant and steal money, engage in market manipulation, predatory pricing, uh, discrimination, all these things that they did, which is what the Tea Party wanted and what Trump wants. The answer was we have to create a well-managed market economy, a progressive market economy uh, with regulations to make sure that markets serve society. So it gave rise to this movement, which actually undermines the interests of the very people who are pushing it. And it really gave rise to the opportunity for demagogues like Trump to exploit that discontent. 
It's a very sad. It's a tragic irony in a way. Yes, very much so. Um, how does now the pandemic contribute to that inequality and and all that uh, perceptions? The, at the beginning of the pandemic, there was at the very beginning was the belief we are all equal in front of the virus. Now we've seen that's not at all the case. Yeah, very much. This virus is not an equal opportunity virus. It goes after people who are in poor health condition. And unfortunately, people, there's a high correlation between poor health and low income. And that's especially true in countries like the United States, where we don't recognize the right of access to health care as a basic human right. We don't have universal access to health care. And uh, uh, President Trump wants to take health care away from some 20 million more Americans. Uh, uh, the result of this is, and this goes back to the broad issue of self-interest, life expectancy in the United States is lower than in almost any of the other advanced countries, even though we spend so much more on health care. Uh, we spend about 18% of GDP on healthcare. France spends 11% of GDP. Um, Germany spends a little bit uh, more than that, but still not very much. And when you make an adjustment for difference in per capita income, uh, we're spending almost twice as much of, as France with worse outcomes and huge disparities. So the, this is the point. Because of the huge disparities, we provide a very fertile field for the virus to take up uh, advantage of. And the irony of all it is, of, of all this is that so many people who we depend on and we see we are so dependent, you know, people we call essential workers have to be at work. They are the most exposed. So we are asking them to provide essential services. They are the most exposed, the lowest paid, the worst health condi uh, conditions, and we don't even provide them protective gear. We don't even provide them masks. Short-sighted corporations didn't even want to provide them with a, a paid sick leave. We're the only advanced country that doesn't have paid sick leave. Mm -hmm. So the so what we're finding is this virus is going after the poor, but at the same time the poor are suffering the most, and we're winding up as a result with even greater inequality. The people at the top, the bankers, can go ahead of their their banking on Zoom, but the frontline workers. The people who are working in, in, in waiters, waitresses, they're losing their jobs. And uh, so the, the, what we're seeing actually in so much of the data, you know, the, the expression that's being used in the United States now is a K-shaped recovery. The people at the top recovering, the people at the bottom going down. I see. K-shaped recovery. Yeah. Um, in, in one of your most recent books, uh, you, you have chosen the interesting title, People, Power and Profits, Progressive Capitalism for an Age of Discontent. Uh, you, you talk about the people and the, interestingly, there's a, a large section on, on the feeling of powerlessness of the people. They have no power to influence the economic circumstances, the working conditions, which they probably suffer from. Uh, they, they have the feeling that they can't change the political circumstances they are living in. So, so what would be the agenda to give them back the power, not only the feeling, but give them back the real power to make things change? Yeah, uh, I thought a lot about the title of my book. And the reason I put people in the beginning is uh, I wanted to emphasize that our social institutions, markets and government are all about enriching the lives of people, helping people. And I wanted to make sure that that was the first word that people thought about. But the second word was power. Now, we were talking before about uh, 
the uh, neoliberalism, market fundamentalism, part of the idea there is a competitive economy where no one has power. And so the word power was purged out of economics almost. Mm. Uh, economists didn't want to talk about power. Nobody had power. Well, that was just wrong. And uh, in a way, we didn't have tools how to deal with the concept of power until maybe 40, 50 years ago, 40, you know, with, with the development of game theory. And game theory gave us mathematical precise tools um, a very influential uh, German economist, uh, Sultan, uh, got a Nobel Prize for his work in, in this area. Uh, so uh, we have tools now to analyze it. And you look at it and you say, yes, there is a lot of power, concentration of power. And that power is both in the economic arena and in the political arena. And the most noxious the most dangerous, the most undermining of democracy is the link between the economic and the political power. So I mentioned before, we have lots of uh, sectors of our economy where there are one, two, three fir firms that dominate. Google, Facebook, they have power. In fact, they have so much power that they can, by allowing political misinformation, they can manipulate elections. We know that, it happened. Um, not only in the United States, but it's happened all over Europe. So uh, we know the power that these tools and these corporations have. The problem is, especially in democracies, countries like the United States, where money can buy uh, votes, not in the way that it does in some very poor countries, but through it. market, through through advertising, through uh, a variety of channels, uh, money matters. And that's why you see the candidates spending, even in the last election, billion dollars. They call them campaign contributions, but they're not campaign contributions in the way, usual use of the term, when it comes from the car, large corporations, they're investments. They're investments to get legislation like they want. You know, a lot of discussion right now about the Supreme Court in the United States. The Supreme Court said, well, if there were even a whiff of corruption in money, that would be one thing. Well, where, what planet are the Supreme Court at? There is not only a whiff you can smell it, uh, it's the odor of corruption. And uh, uh, it is pervasive in the United States. Rich people not wanting to get uh, taxed, pushing for a tax bill, which raises the tax on a majority of people in the middle in order to get a tax cut for the billionaires and the corporations. Now, so, what is quite striking in the United States is that there are many billionaires who believe in justice, in social justice. People like Warren Buffett, who said it's wrong that he's paying a lower tax rate than his secretary. So good, for, fortunately, we have good people. We have some really bad people like Warren Trump, like, 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 uh, like uh, Donald. Donald. We have really good people like Warren Buffett. So, um, you know, the good, it, we, every day we get reminded of the two sides of human nature. That's good that we, we know that they are both existent and we don't have to be pessimistic. Uh, the, 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 the good natures might come uh, more present. Uh. Yeah, and hopefully in the end uh, that will win over. Hopefully, yeah. but what we also know is that that the way in which people behave and react depends on the structures around them. And if the structures, uh, you know, if they benefit selfishness, egoism, or if a picture of that is portrayed, then people react more selfish, etc. So it's it's a complex uh, link between. 
Yeah, that's one of the things I emphasized in my in my book that that uh, one of the reasons the financial sector generates so much greed is that it's created a culture of greed. And uh, if we had uh, more cooperatives institutions in our society, we would cultivate more cooperative behavior. So I, I really believe that, you know, it, it's not that we're necessarily born in one way or another. You know, as parents, we work very hard try to get our children to be honest, to be cooperative, hardworking, um, and sometimes we succeed. I know exactly what you mean. This afternoon, we had a very intense battle between my two sons about a waffle, the last waffle. Uh, I, I, so thanks for mentioning that as well. <laughs> but 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 what would be the, the instruments when we now look at the nation state at the level of the nation state to foster, let's say, a more a fairer economy? Uh, you have talked already about taxes. Um, that might be one issue, but there are, I guess, other issues and instruments. Oh, very much so. You know, one of the the things that economists uh, now recognize much more strongly than they did earlier um, is that markets don't exist in a vacuum. Uh, we have to structure markets. Uh, uh, you're in the law faculty, I think, and, and you know that's what law is about. It's about structuring. Uh, <laughs> The con society. Uh, we have antitrust laws to try to make the markets more competitive. We have labor law. How you design the labor law determines the bargaining power of workers. If you have laws that allow corporations to have a lot of market power, but don't allow workers to have any power, you're going to get inequality. Wages will be driven down. Bankruptcy law, uh, you know, that's often viewed as a very arcane subject that only um, um, lawyers talk about. Uh, I began, I realized uh, in a paper I wrote actually 50 years ago, bankruptcy is really important part of uh, the rules of the game. And uh, the United States passed uh, two provisions in our bankruptcy law that have been three provisions that have been absolutely disastrous. Uh, one is that when a company goes bankrupt, the first claim are the derivatives, those risky products that brought on, that played such a big role in the 2008 crisis. We were in effect encouraging risky derivatives. Uh, we had, a, you might call it an industrial policy for instability. Why? Well, it was all done in secret without anybody really knowing much about it, but it was in the legislation. The second thing is we passed legislation that said students cannot discharge their debt even in bankruptcy. And parents that co-sign a student loan can't discharge that debt even when the student dies. So you could imagine this really hampers opportunity for those who, especially in a country like in America where education, higher education is so expensive. And thirdly, the way I put it in one of my books, we introduced partial indentured servitude. That uh, if you get overly indented, you could work the rest of your life with, I give an example, 25% of your income for the rest of your life goes to the bank. Every year, you thought you paid it off and they charge you just enough to keep you as an indentured servitude servant. 25% of your income for the rest of your life. Now, these are all things that you might call cruel, how could you do it? Well, when you have, going back to the theme we talked about before, when you have a political system 
that is so corrupt and that gives so much power to money, where is money? Of course, in the banks. And the banks, therefore, have the ability to shape the legislation and they shape it for their own interest. So the rules of the market economy are absolutely essential and they shape what we call today pre-distribution, the market distribution of income. So yes, expenditure policy is important, tax policy is important, but so are the rules of the game. What about, I know that you were involved in discussions about that, uh, what about the way in which we measure growth? It's not the question if the market benefits the greater good, the individual happiness or something, it's just uh, arithmetic growth. Um, you, you have done some work on that. Very much so. I meant to mention, I've actually written two books on this issue of rewriting the rules of the economy to make it more equal, more just, better. Uh, one called Rewriting the Rules uh, of the European Economy uh, with uh, a group of economists from uh, FEPS, the Foundation for in Progressive Studies, and uh, another one, Rewriting the Rules of the American Economy, with a group of uh, economists at the Roosevelt Institute. Now, on the issue of, of uh, a critical issue facing every society is, what should we be trying to do? What should be our objective? And unfortunately, we live in a, in a very metric or, oriented society. We want to measures. Uh, we want to know how well we're doing. And, but one of the things that I've, uh, my work has been uh, emphasized is if you measure the wrong thing, you'll do the wrong thing. So we need, I've argued, a democratic dialogue to determine what we should want, what we should be doing. I chaired a commission uh, appointed by uh, the president of France, uh, international commission, Nobel Prize winners, uh, across the board and social scientists. And our conclusion was GDP is not a good measure of well, societal well-being. Um, it was published in a book called Mismeasuring Our Lives. And uh, it was not a good measure because it, it doesn't talk about inequality. You could have GDP going up and only two or three people at the top doing well and most people doing poorly. That's not a good society. It doesn't talk about sustainability. We could be doing well today, but at the expense of our future, environmental degradation. Uh, so it doesn't talk about sustainability. Um, it doesn't talk about uh, the many dimensions that contribute to well-being in a very broad way, like security or even leisure. Uh, Many people in Europe view their summer vacations, their four weeks or five weeks, uh, as very important. In America, many, many companies only give two weeks. And uh, one of the reasons the United States has a higher per capita GDP is we work longer. But that doesn't make, make people better, happier, doesn't make them better off. Uh, it makes them more stressed and it, it, it actually doesn't uh, uh, contribute to, to well-being. So there's been a broad agenda to uh, broaden out the criteria of what makes for a good society. Good, uh, we call it a, the, uh, our commission. Uh, on the measurement of economic performance and social progress. Mm -hmm. We didn't want to just limit it to economics. We said economic performance and social progress. And uh, the OECD has actually done a very good job of taking up this agenda, constructing something they call the Better Life Index, and trying to talk about the very many dimensions 
of what makes for a good society. Yeah, so, we, so we have to measure the right thing to go into the right direction. Very much so. Probably Bhutan is our example of the happiness of the people, as far as I know, in the constitution of that tiny country. Um, there's, so we are at the level where we discuss what to do. Um, and one of the big questions in these days is uh, also what to do with the investments that we probably need to to deal with the with the curves that we see the v curve or the k curve uh, how how to 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 it's not going to be v it's it's u or k it's a bad alternatives i guess um and, and you the the the, uh, the audience is asking what that kind of investment should be what should be the the the, the investment that we need now to have a return uh, we well, actually fixed it very much well with the previous question. Um, you know, at the beginning, when when there was the hope that it would be V, uh, when we, their hope was that it would be a short four, six, eight week interruption, and then we'll go back to normal. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that that too was a fantasy. No one thinks that now. Um, at that time, a lot of people said uh, we want to go back to where we were in January. 2020. Today, as we've seen all the problems associated with the pandemic, the inequalities that have been exposed and aggravated, uh, the lack of resilience of our supply chains, uh, as we've seen certain sectors particularly adversely affected, including our knowledge sector, which is one of the most education sector, which is uh, sectors of the future. Uh, that's why uh, countries around the world are talking about building back better. Not going back to January 2020, but to going forward to what kind of a world we want to have, would want to have post pandemic. And this is especially important because for two reasons. One, never before has government spent so much money citizens have the right because we've intervened at such scale in the economy to say we ought to make sure that that economy that we've created not we've done it through our money we have saved it, it reflects what we want so it ought to reflect our sense of values priorities what kind of what serves us in, in individuals and the second one is We've spent so much money that there will be a hesitancy to spend more. So we have to make sure that this money does dual duty, dual purpose. Yeah. And so as we are using the money to recover, and you might say to restore, it really is not restoring back to where we were, but to creating this new economy. And, and I, I focus on, uh, uh, you know, three or four things, particularly for the United States, but I think this is true for most other. Clearly, we have to have a greener economy. We have to make the green transition. Um, this is an, an existential issue for, for all of us, for the world. Secondly, we have to build back more equal. Uh, the divides in our society are just too great. We won't function as democracies. We won't function as societies. Uh, third, we have to be a, a, a more knowledge-based economy. Uh, the economy of the future is, is going to be uh, a more uh, knowledge-based uh, economy. Uh, economy. And one of the sectors that's been most adversely affected, as I said, is has been the knowledge sector, you know, schools, uh, when where people come in close contact with each other, they've really been hurt uh, uh, very badly. And obviously, fourth, we have to have a healthier economy. It's very clear that we have uh, an, uh, healthier people and a more resilient economy. 
So, so listening to you, there's a, you have somehow outlined, you have sketched the political agenda in a long-term perspective, fixing the markets, embedding the markets into societies and into rules. You have also talked about investment to, to make the recovery work. Um, and the agenda you, you did present reminds me, of course, to the political ideas, the political philosophy of, of the social democrats in Europe, at least. Uh, you know, the thinking about the bargaining power, all that kind of things. So. Very much so. In fact, I, you know, I, I sometimes say, if I had written my book, People, Power and Profits, a progressive agenda for an age of discontent, if I had been writing that in Europe, I would have titled it uh, People, Power and Profits, uh, um, a, a uh, reinvigorated social democracy for Europe. Uh, because it is about, uh, it is really the social democratic agenda, but it's, I would argue uh, it's trying to uh, reinvigorate that social democratic agenda, you know, that goes back a, a long time, but um, the world changing and we have to constantly reassess what uh, that social democratic agenda means today. So we want to be optimistic in the talk, but when you look at the political forces in Europe, at the political landscape, um, um, it's, it's hard if, if you think that social democracy has some good ideas to contribute to make our world better. It's hard to be optimistic. We see a constant decline of social democracy in most parts of Europe. Um, when we look at the US current political situation, it's also kind of depressing. Well, let me give you an element of optimism. Maybe I come from a part of the United States, the Midwest, which is a reputation of, of, of optimism. Uh, what makes me optimistic is the engagement of young people, my students, uh, people in their 20s, 30s. Um, if I go through the social democratic platform, agenda, the issues they care about, two to one, it is supported by young people. Three to one, supported by young people. We talk about healthcare, education. Uh, we, we talk about uh, uh, issues of equality, uh, social justice, racial equality. Uh, you talk about minimum wages, uh, healthcare. I, I go through every issue, and I talk about this in my book, every competition policy. Um, you know, uh, I'm so used to talking to older people that when I begin talking about them, I, I expect uh, a lot of pushback. I talk to my students, they say, what do you, why are you arguing? We agree with you. There's no argument here. <laughs> so there's a divide. And it is interesting. Uh, I think Bernie Sanders must find this a little bit uh, uh, in the same way that I do. Uh, here are some, uh, you might call senior citizens, feeling very close to our young people. There's a little bit of a problem of what happened to the people in between. <laughs> Details. <laughs> but, but we are, I, I feel so, so much uh, solidarity with a lot of, uh, with my young students. There's, there's one final question from the audience that I would like to pose because I think it fits in. Yeah? You have talked about generations and, 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 and optimism and uh, if I may say so, a common interest of uh, probably a more senior generation and the younger generation. Um, Rainer is asking the question, we, will there be a struggle for a new world lead to serious conflicts of an ideological, political and social nature? So, um, um. I think there's, there is going to be some conflict. Um, oh, there is some conflict. You see it in the United States. Um, but uh, it's going to take two forms. Um, 
in advanced countries, uh, I think it's going to be trying to persuade the uh, many of those who have not done so well, not participated in our prosperity. We haven't had share of prosperity that a progressive agenda or social democratic agenda is the best way for them to succeed in their lives and reflects the values of democracy, which should be so ingrained. Um, it, it's really, uh, I would call it, and it's one of the things I emphasize again in my book, reinvigorating the Enlightenment agenda. Uh, 200 years later, uh, Enlightenment agenda was, was, was about the importance of science and progress, uh, uh, going away from authoritarian uh, authoritarianism of, of one form or another, whether authority came from on high, from religion or from a king. It was about creating new forms of social institutions that were more democratic. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that's a battle that, that I believe we will win. Uh, in the advanced countries. Um, and uh, I really believe it uh, because I see two to one, three to one mm -hmm. people supporting this. Uh, now, uh, if we can maintain our democracy long enough, and you, as you know, President Trump has not said he will leave office peacefully. And so we are very, very concerned about where this is you know, the next three months are uh, in moments of enormous tension uh, in the United States. So that's one battle. But then there's another battle in the emerging markets and developing countries where they're struggling to develop. The, the gap between them and the banks countries is huge. And uh, they will be tempted to say, look at some of the countries that were most successful in development were countries that were not democratic. And democracy is, you might call, a luxury for the rich. I think that's wrong. I think that uh, no one can afford authoritarianism. What it does to a society, what it, uh, it, 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 what it does to the human spirit, um, uh, what it does to individuals uh, is not acceptable. So that's going to be, that's a different battle. And it's a battle where the developed countries, the advanced countries, have to work together to provide opportunities for these emerging markets in developing countries and say, there is an alternative path. We, we will help you um, through fair trade, through assistance, through sharing of knowledge, through multilateral institutions, uh, that's a, an agenda that hopefully we can get uh, more, you know, after the pandemic is over, uh, it will be a very important uh, agenda. But right in the middle of the pandemic, we are seeing some aspects of that. Uh, the special drawing rights of this money that the IMF can uh, uh, create. Um, uh, the IMF has called for a $500 billion issuance of that. There's broad support for it. Uh, many European countries that say they don't need their, their, their allocation will have committed to lending or giving that to developing countries and emerging markets. And the only st thing standing in the way right now is uh, the Trump administration. 
so it brings us somehow back to the beginning of our talk. We need global cooperation. We need global institutions that foster cooperations and it's uh, in our common interest. Very much so. And, and if we're going to get this kind of uh, democratic agenda, uh, 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 gonna win on the global scale, I think we have to do that. Yeah, and, and there will be conflicts, uh, but, but that's also something we learned from history. If you progress, there are always conflicts. Uh, but, but we can be optimistic. You draw the, the big picture, the way from the Enlightenment to today was a history of process. We bounce back, yeah. but in general, a history of process. Um, so we are, I'm afraid uh, we, we are coming to the end of our time. We could go on for hours. Uh, it's, it's an incredible pleasure to listen to, listen to you. But, but as you can see, it has become evening in Germany. We are, uh, unfortunately, we have to come to an end with our talk. But I would like to pose a final question to you. We, we ask all our participants. We, are, we continue to be optimistic and we imagine that in 10 years from now, in 2030, we will have a fairer, a better economy that serves more the people. What was the most decisive thing that we did change in 2020? What is the, the single button we, we have to press? Well, I, you know, there's no single thing. We have to learn how to do many things at one time. Uh, and that's what the lesson we have to recover and we have to recover better, greener, more knowledge-based, more equal. Um, if we don't solve the climate change issue, uh, we won't be able to do anything else. Uh, if we don't solve the problem of the great divide in our society, we will be riven apart. So to me, these are two things that we have no choice. We have to solve them. And if in 2030 we're discussing what did we do right, it'll be that we went after both of these simultaneously as we recovered from COVID-19. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, I, I, I would love to continue that conversation in 2030. Yeah, and, and you know, just tick that we are right and right. And I hope I'll be around to continue it with you. <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> thank you so much, Joe. It was yeah, a highly you. inspiring, very, very interesting talk. Um, 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 it was great to benefit from your knowledge and also from your inspiration and your optimism. I think we thank need you. optimism to make a world a better place. Um, thank you so much. Okay. Thanks also thank to you. the audience. Um, and for all the people who supported us here today, um, if you can't get enough of Joe, watch at his website. Uh, there you will find an overview of his publications, of his contributions. And this talk will be online at this very place um, very soon. So there's more to come yet. Um, thank you all for participating. Thanks, Joe. You skipped even your lunch, I guess, for being with yes, us. Okay. That's, that's a great sacrifice that we really much appreciate. Thank you. Thanks and goodbye. Bye-bye.